and now we can uh, start with the second speak speaker of the morning session. Great. Hi. Hello, Michael. Hi. Okay. Hello. So I uh, welcome Michael uh, Gray. Grabe, sorry. Who is oh, no, going to? Great. It's, it's great. Okay. So Antonio Dinti, it's fault of Antonio Dinti. Uh, how that, so Michael uh, Grabe, who is going to tell us about how mitochondrial uncouplers induce proton leak. So please, great. you can try to share your screen. I will tell you there. if everything is okay. Yeah. Okay. So is that, is that right? Yes. Great. Fantastic. So, please. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to talk about work that we've been doing over the past two to three years uh, on trying to think about protons going across mitochondria. And so this work was carried out in close collaboration with Yuri Kirichok's lab here at UCSF. Um, the postdoc that did all of the experimental work that I'm going to talk about is Amber Berthel. Um, and then, uh, and she's now just recently moved on from UCSF and is now an assistant professor at UCLA. Um, all the docking simulations I'm going to talk about were carried out by Paolo Bisignano, who is a postdoc in the group for many years and now is a staff scientist at Lawrence Livermore Labs here, also in California. And then uh, Andrew Natale did all of the simulations and, and just did a lot of the lion's share of the simulations that I'll be talking about as well. And so if we think about um, how much heat we produce, if we're just sitting here at rest, we consume about 75 watts, even, even just sitting here. And what would happen if we could increase thermogenesis even further? If we could do that, we might imagine that we could start to address some of the metabolic syndromes associated with uh, obesity, such as type 2 diabetes. If we could expend some of this heat in some kind of a useful way, we might be able to get back to normal temperature or normal weights and then reverse some of the major problems with metabolic syndromes that I'll talk about. The real question is, how do we increase thermogenesis? The mitochondria are the primary way that we have uh, heating in our body um, and their job is either to make ATP primarily in skeletal muscle or to produce heat um, in specialized uh, cells. Those specialized cells are brown fat and if we look in adult um, on the left hand side we can see the places that we have brown fat, the, uh, the darker regions. They, they produce heat um, and then in skeletal muscle, they produce actually very little heat because they've evolved primarily to produce ATP to carry out all of the functions that they need to during muscle contraction and, and so on and so forth. Um, and so it's really only children that have uh, quite a substantial amount of brown fat. And so it makes this a difficult question. I think one of the first clues came from munitions factories in uh, France during World War I, where they were making explosives, and one of the byproducts of this explosive is DNP, small phenol groups, um, that basically led to incredible weight loss in people that were working in these factories. And it became known that if you just take DNP, you can have uh, quite a lot of energy expenditure, and it's been recorded that up to 10 pounds per week you can lose without any dieting or exercise. It became a fad in the 1930s for people to start to use this, uh, specifically in Hollywood, and continues today for bodybuilders, where people basically want to cut back on their, uh, their fat and, uh, and, and keep weight loss. Um, and it's been shown recently by groups at, at Yale that in uh, a mouse model of metabolic syndromes, uh, if you feed mice that are basically diabetic mice uh, showing signs of fatty liver disease in rats and mice, here this is rat data, um, you can actually reverse uh, uh, ideas of metabolic syndrome uh, within two weeks. Uh, and you can return uh, livers to looking normal, you can return insulin levels back to normal, um, and it seems to be almost a bit of a miracle drug. The problem is that it was. It can cause heart attacks. I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later. Um, this is a 
This is an image from a popular fitness website <laughs> suggesting that it's a killer weight loss pill. Um, it's toxic. It has phenol, it's, uh, as are many phenol-based drugs. Um, DNP causes pH collapse across all membranes. It's known as a general protonophore. And, and fatalities are, are associated with hypothermia followed by cardiovascular collapse. And it was really one of the first drugs that was banned by the FDA uh, in the United States whenever the FDI, uh, soon after the FDA was, uh, was originally founded. So what are the mechanisms of mitochondrial thermogenesis? We hope that by answering these kinds of questions, we can help think about mitochondrial and cellular thermogenesis to combat these diseases. Um, and this is really where some of the science comes in from Yuri's lab. If we think about energy sources like a hamburger here, uh, it goes into the mitochondria uh, in some way or another and either is going to make a decision to make ATP or make heat. Um, in a very simple schematic of a simple mito single mitochondria, this energy is going to be used to pump protons uh, through the complex electron transport chain to basically energize the inner membrane mito of the mitochondria. Uh, eventually, those protons are going to flow back in through the FATPases in order to turn ADP into ATP um, if it's in a, a, a skeletal muscle or a non-brown fat muscle. Um, but what's going to happen in those few brown, uh, those few brown uh, and beige cells is that there are dedicated proton leaks that allow the protons to flow back in. And just like taking a battery and hooking up both the terminals to the battery with a, sh a short circuit, you end up generating a lot of heat. And UCP1 is a proteins of, un we've never seen uh, structures of, of UCP1s yet. Uh, but we know that those are only expressed in those kind of environments. We also know that ATP is a potent blocker of the proton leak in UCP1s, and it's been known for a while that fatty acids, such as arachidonic acid, uh, increase uh, the propensity of leaking through UCP1. And so DNP, how is it thought to work? It's thought, it's known to be a general protonophore, which means that it can float across membranes. And whenever it grabs, uh, it has a protonatable grape group on that hydroxyl group that you can see. I don't know if my pointer works at all uh, right here. And it can grab that proton, delocalize it across the entire structure so that it's a, a rather large uh, anion, uh, pardon me, it, it, so it moves to a neutral state, uh, a positive state, and then moves across in a delocalized manner right through the membrane, not unlike the anesthetics that Werner was just talking to us about, drops off its proton and then shuttles back. And we know that this is its primary mechanism for uh, allowing pH gradients to run down in, in general membranes. Okay, so we wanted to test these ideas more thoroughly, uh, at least Yuri's group did. And so Yuri's group is one of the only groups and really one of the first groups that's been able to patch mitochondria. Yuri developed these techniques when he was in David Clapham's lab at Harvard before moving to UCSF many years ago. So he can take different tissues from rat or mice, extract their mitochondria, and through mechanical disruption, he can actually pull the inner membrane of the mitochondria away from the outer membrane. And you can see an image on the right-hand side here of the inner and the outer membrane. And then he can do direct pipette onto that, make a nice gigaohm seal and record currents, um, and really test some of the molecular principles uh, that have laid out uh, what we think about in this system. Uh, and so just like many of the other uh, electric uh, patch clamp recordings, we have inward current, which is a negative current on the left-hand side. This is going to be uh, going in. And so uh, positive charges going in are going to record as a negative downward deflection here on the right-hand side, uh, while outward currents are going to be uh, positive and going up. And so uh, this is UCP1 currents that are going through brown and beige fat. And you can see in red here, a very nice deflection uh, during a voltage ramp, causing protons to move in during negative voltages and then go out under positive voltages and sweeping through. GDP is a known potent inhibitor of uh, UCP1 dependent currents. And you can see in this control, the black, there's very little current whatsoever through this particular mitochondrial inner membrane. So, what Amber first did several years ago is to confirm what had been uh, thought uh, under these conditions for UCP1. And she was able to show these kinds of currents that she can get strong, positive, 
uh, proton currents uh, in the presence of uh, 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 from these beige beige uh, beige fat that get blocked by GDP. Um, and then she uh, grew up mice that had UCP1 double knockouts, and she sees that all that current goes away, and we can see that the red and the uh, black curves. Uh, overlay on each other. Uh, again, just showing that UCP1 is the main uncoupling proton for subcutaneous beige um, adipocytes. More recently, she showed uh, where are the are there proton currents in skeletal muscle? You know, this is really a, a big mystery, and 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 the, the mechanism in skeletal muscle. You know, the vast majority of the ATP producing cells in our body. What's going on? If you look uh, under control conditions, you can see very little current. Um, and then what she realized is that you add arachidonic acid. And I think this was appreciated. If you add arachidonic acid in these cases, um, you do see uncoupling happen. Um, and the real question becomes what protein is responsible for doing this in skeletal muscles because UCP1 is not expressed in those cell types. And you can see that uh, smooth muscle here, she has a nice response from SM, that's smooth muscle, heart, less uh, robust currents, but less liver and kidney, even less. And so there are many family members in the UCP1 family. This is the SLC25 family, and I'm showing you just a few of, the, of them here. I think there's something like, oh, it says it right there. There's 50 members in this family, of which the top three have the closest identity. Uh, UCP1, 2, and 3 are the closest identity to each other. But then she just went down this list and started to look at all of these, looking at knockouts, looking at pharmacological agents to try to figure out what's going on in this case. And what she realized um, pretty quickly is that ADP, ATP carrier, basically the exchanger responsible for getting newly minted ATP out of the mitochondria and ADP back into the mitochondria to basically get the cycle going is responsible for this arachidonic acid or fatty acid induced uh, uncoupling. And so on the left hand side, she's showing uh, heart mitochondria where she's basically added arachidonic acid in red at two micromolar and she can see robust proton currents over control, the black, when she does a voltage ramp. If she adds a specific inhibitor, carboxytriclicide uh, to that prep, we now get this blue curve and we see that she gets rid of most of the currents that are involved. And another, um, uh, another uh, pharmacological agent that's often used is buncreatic acid. On the right-hand side, you can see the buncreatic acid does the same thing. And so basically, pharmacologically, she was able to show that this arachidonic acid is basically rendered ineffective in the presence of these potent inhibitors of AAC. She then went on to do the genetics and she grew up cells that were AAC1 double knockouts on the right-hand side. And again, she loses this uh, protonophoric current. There's a little bit of residual current left over on the right-hand side of this right-hand side figure um, in the outward direction. Um, but basically she's getting rid of all of, the, uh, of that. And so basically, she published this in Nature uh, about a year and a half ago now, showing that AAC is responsible for fatty acid-dependent proton current. Well, what do we know about AAC? Um, so AAC is a, uh, one of the, uh, well, I don't know if I want to say one of the first, but it's been a mitochondrial proton channel, uh, pardon me, it's mitochondrial transporter that's been solved in uh, one state starting back many years ago. and, and um, there have been many simulations that people have ca been carried out on, on this protein already. It's on the left-hand side, and this is the C state. And the C state is means that it's outward open and facing uh, what would be the cytoplasm or the inner membrane space of the mitochondria. And the matrix is down below. This is the inside where um, FATPase is basically turning ADP into ATP and so on and so forth. Um, Edmund Kunji's lab, um, uh, on, uh, recently solved the M state configuration, and this is on the right hand side. And basically, it's inward facing uh, as if it's ready to um, deliver um, or pick up nucleotides from the matrix side of the mitochondria. And so, we basically have two nice structures to start to investigate what's going on in this case. ADP comes in from the outside during normal cycle. It's going to somehow transition to a C state by engaging lots of residues that interact with the phosphate tails and the, and the adenosine ring. And then 
go to an inward state to deliver the ADP. Now it's ready to pick up the ATP and reset and go back and forth. So we started to carry out, and by we, I mean uh, Andrew, uh, simulations first, trying to understand the fatty acid interactions with the AAC1. And so I'm going to talk about basic classic, classic um, molecular dynamic simulations uh, like uh, several, several people have said, I think Lucy said last night, these are kind of vanilla simulations. There's nothing fancy going on. Um, we're going to simulate the C state and the M state in complex with cardiolipin uh, that come along with the uh, crystal structures. Um, the M state is, uh, I think we use, we're going to use bovine for the outward facing and the inward facing. I can't remember the exact protein that was done, but um, uh, what organism it's from, but we're going to actually try to, we, we made a homology model. It's nearly, it's very, very similar to the C state, um, but there are, uh, especially through, throughout the uh, binding site, but there are some differences. And so we don't often simulate homology models, but in this case, we did for the M state simulations. Um, each membrane has around 210 lipids per system, so they're not that big. They're quite small, around 80,000 atoms. And we carried simulations out with eight arachidonic acid uh, placed randomly in the outer and eight in the inner leaflet, um, along with PC, PE, and cardiolipin. And so we carried out uh, initially four trajectories um, in each state. Um, the C state confirmations were all carried out for 20 microseconds, while the four um, trajectories for the M state were an aggregate of 10 microseconds. And so this is a rather long simulation, but I'm going to show you two of the four simulations of the outward facing C state configuration. And I'm highlighting one uh, fatty acid in yellow. All of the other atoms are there. Um, it's full atom, uh, tip 3P water molecules, um, so on and so forth. And the reason why I'm showing these two uh, is because some interesting things happened that reminded me a little bit of the talk the other day uh, by, uh, in which we saw one of the lipid flipases um, from uh, Gerhard's. Uh, but in this case, what we can see on that right-hand side already is that the uh, arachidonic acid um, leading with its carboxylate, which is negatively charged, um, jumps into the channel because it's a very positively charged channel because it likes uh, all those phosphates on ADP and ATP. So that wasn't completely surprising. But then it completely extracts its tail from the lipid bilayer and lives in this inner cavity um, for a while. And in fact, you can see at different points in time, it's got the carboxylate pointing downward and the tail interacting in this cavity um, kind of all by itself uh, as a single lipid. And then eventually on the right-hand side, what we see is that it finds a position and points its tail out so that it can satisfy having its tail in the lipid bilayer while having the carboxylate pointing inward and interacting with about three different um, uh, basic residues, arginines and a lysine, uh, to satisfy the charge on the carboxylate. These these two uh, events, while anecdotal, they're just uh, single simulations, uh, they both entered through the same um, gap between TM1 and 2 on the uh, outer leaflet of the mitochondrial membrane. Um, and by the end, they both stick their tail through a, through a hole, basically, a fenestration that's apparent in TM5 and 6 um, uh, in order to reach this final state. And then we never see them leave this state for, I think these are both four or five microsecond simulations each. Um, and I can't see things at the bottom. Okay, um, the head group is at the bottom of the pocket around halfway across the membrane. And so we found this to be really compelling. Um, and so let me see if I can keep going. Um, and so we wanted to think more about what could the head group be doing. And this is experiments that Amber had already carried out to think about what the head group is going and doing. And so she also looked not only at normal uh, carboxylate head groups, but she also looked at uh, sulfonamides, like I'm showing here. They have a pKa that's close to zero, while um, carboxylates have pKa's in the range of 4.2 or so. And in this case, when she adds these to her preps, she sees no current whatsoever over control, indicating that something about that sulfonamide head, head group cannot make this um, proton leak current happen. And so we started to think that if these 
arachidonic acids are getting into the center of this, then maybe they're acting as a stepping stone oops, for protons to come in and then somehow sneak on through, through the protein in order to facilitate proton leak. Um, how that happens, we don't exactly know, but it's a, a compelling hypothesis to start. The next thing we wanted to think about is how does DNP potentially interact with these different simulations? Um, and it's been thought here in this dashed line that it just diffuses across the membrane in a non-selective manner, delivers its proton, shuttles back without or flows back across the membrane without the proton and so on and so forth. Um, and so um, this, this would be the, the, the kind of scheme. FCCP, uh, another pharmacological agent that's often used um, in studying pH regulatory mechanisms also is thought to happen uh, in a very similar manner. It's rather uh, hydrophobic, but it has the ability to uh, bind hydrogens uh, and delocalize uh, the electronic structure. Okay, so whenever Amber adds DNP to these same skeletal preps, she sees really great proton currents. And that's what I'm showing you here on the left-hand side. Um, and this was um, never appreciated whatsoever. Uh, it's been known that DNP will cause this. Okay, but let me get to what, what wasn't appreciated next. It's a, it, it happens in a dose-dependent manner uh, whenever she carries these out. Um, and the amount of current that she gets over, say, a plasma membrane prep um, where she's normalized, where we're normalizing for area per lipid head group here, or uh, of the patch of the membrane. This is really a head-to-head -head comparison between the effective DNP on the inner membrane versus the plasma membrane. It is so much more powerful in the inner membrane. And this started to make her wonder, why is this the case? And is it just acting as a non-selective protonophore in both the plasma membrane and the inner membrane? She started to think that that might not be the case because the current is so big. And so what she started to do is to use these pharmacological agents again. And when she adds Cutter, this um, uh, inhibitor of AAC, she can get rid of quite a bit of um, her current, um, just as we see moving from the red to the blue curve. And also whenever she goes to AAC1 knockouts here on the right-hand side, the Cutter dependent sensitivity of that proton current goes away. So this started to let us think that Basically, DNP is having an influence probably in a, in a, in a membrane-specific manner that does not depend on uh, any kind of a protein, but it's certainly doing it in an AC1-dependent manner. And so we realize that DNP is inducing these proton currents through AAC1, uh, AAC, just like uh, fatty acid in some sense. Well, is it just like it or not? Um, so we, Pallas started carrying out uh, docking simulations where she took the AAC1 structure um, and she uh, docked in DNP uh, to, the entire, to the entire protein. Um, and she realized that there's one site where uh, it gives rise to rather stable poses, um, uh, good looking poses in which um, the phenol group is packed up against one side of a hydrophobic environment with that isoleucine 183 deep at the bottom of the cavity. And uh, the nitrile groups are able to interact with things like uh, the aspartic acid 231 and the serine 179 and getting some uh, uh, T pi stacking interactions with this um, Y186 up top. Um, and so this seemed to be rather reproducible and she gets these same poses. This is the solid, this is the solid image I'm showing you. She gets same poses whether or not she protonates DNP or whether she leaves it in its negatively charged form. And so, yeah, both of those bind to the same place. It's in a greasy pocket um, and the nitro groups are interacting with polar moieties. If we look, this is looking down on AAC1 from the outside, the cytoplasm, you can see that DNP is backed up against this hydrophobic cavity I talked about um, in the back, whereas our fatty acid, these are, these are superposed from two separate simulations or docking experiments. Um, the fatty acid is more on the bottom side in this case, and you can see the carboxylate interacting with these arginine, lysine, arginine over here, and kind of dancing back and forth to get good interactions with all of those. Um, if I don't think I'm gonna show you, I'll go, 
Um, uh, us and others have docked ATP and ADP into this site. It's always easier to dock ADP in than, rather than ATP just because that extra phosphate. But regardless, this pocket, um, I think it's well thought of, this pocket is where the adenosine ring is going to sit and the, these uh, arginines and lysines are gonna be important for interacting with the phosphate tails. So this is exactly the orthosteric site for where ATP or ADP would dock into this. We also carried out DNP simulations, again, on the same systems that I just talked about already without the arachidonic acid. Other than that, the systems are quite similar. Um, we carried out four um, trajectories of DNP in the negatively charged state, each lasting uh, for a total of two microseconds total. I think they were each about 500 nanoseconds. And then Andrew carried out two trajectories where he protonated the DNP once it was um, where where we see it and carried out more simulations to see what happens. And so these, uh, these are two separate simulations of DNP starting in solution. And we can see that very quickly within the first 100 nanoseconds, the negatively charged DNP comes into the pocket and sits exactly where the ghost figure is. And the ghost is our Schrodinger docked, docked uh, poses. Um, so even though the greasy part comes in and sits in that greasy part of the cavity, um, you can see that there's still quite a bit of uh, movement in the small molecule. In fact, sometimes you see some excursions where it leaves to go someplace else before coming back. And you can see that the nitro groups are not always uh, lined up the way that we see them optimally in the docked structures, but very, very frequently they are. Um, so the next thing that, um, and so here, these are those two trajectories I showed you right here on the top where we're just asking what's the RMSD of the DNP to that um, final state that it likes to spend most of its time in. And you can see that it quickly comes in and both the blue and the green traces stays there. Um, and, and the next thing that Andrew did was he took DNP, he protonated it once it was in this bound configuration or this uh, in, in the pocket. Um, because we were thinking if it's very positively charged inside this cavity and you have a negative molecule, of course, you're going to have strong electrostatics to bring it in. But now once that electrostatics is gone by adding the proton, is it now going to want to leave? And at least in these 500 nanosecond simulations, it's not. There's enough of the greasy component with those nitro groups interacting with polar moieties that it keeps them right there in that spot. And you can see that it's settled down uh, it doesn't move. In fact, it's a little bit more settled down even than the negatively charged version. Um, and then, uh, oh, and then these were all carried out in the absence of a membrane potential. Uh, we also then applied a, a minus 160 millivolt potential, which is the normal, what we believe is the normal physiological potential across the mitochondrial membrane. The direction of this field is going to cause it to kick off. We're not doing these membrane calculations quite as I would say. Uh, in, quite, in quite the manner that Werner was just talking about. Um, we're actually just applying uh, an electric field uh, on, all of the uh, on all the charged groups in, in a manner similar to the way that Rue and, and Gumbert um, uh, do it uh, and, and describe how to do it. But nonetheless, it gives rise to a force that's gonna move negative charged particles up and positively charged particles in the system down. But in that case also, DNP remains relatively uh, uh, happy in the bottom of the cavity, even in its negatively charged state. So we, th we think there's a real reason to think that, that this cavity likes to have things like DNP in it. It's enriching for them. Okay, so we then, uh, well, we, um, uh, Amber had looked at all other uncouplers mitochondrial uncouplers in the literature that she could find. And here are a few. DNP, FCCP that I talked about already. BAM15 is one that if you are if you know this literature, you, you know about that one. And then SF6847. She realized that basically all of these cause AEC1-dependent mitochondrial uncoupling to happen. Currents get much bigger. We carried out docking simulations on all of them. And this is a bit of a mess. Um, uh, but basically they all dock into very similar places at the bottom of the cavity where they all have a greasy part that packs up against the back. And if you take the protonatable groups, um, because it's different in all these molecules, these are where these pink spheres are. 
in each case, they present the proton um, dependent or the, uh, the proton accepting moieties right in the middle of the membrane about halfway across. So again, we think that maybe if this is causing proton uncoupling, it's making a uh, low energy minimal place for protons to live before they need to traverse across. And so I just wanted to end with two slides trying to rationalize what's going on because the energetics for proton permeation through AC1 are not good. This is an anionic transporter. It's not going to necessarily want to have positively things come in. So we carried out Poisson-Boltzmann calculations on uh, a representative C state um, configuration from the MD simulations that I'm showing you on the top. And I've oriented it so the cytoplasm is on the uh, left-hand side and the matrix on the right. And um, when you carry out these calculations, you realize that right at the pink group where the proton needs to live to basically titrate these residues, you ramp up to a very high positive potential of around 10 kT before reaching this interior part of the closed state M matrix. There is no pathway through these simulations for small molecules. Um, we do not see what we believe is some kind of an uncoupling happen. But nonetheless, that positive 10 kT seems, you know, that's important. And it's probably going to make it very hard for protons to come in um, to get good currents. Um, it, um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about is this kind of membrane reshaping of the, the, the membrane potential. If we do three different membrane potentials, zero in blue, red minus 80, and uh, gold minus 160 physiological, we can see that it basically tilts the membrane potential to make it more favorable on the inside. Protons would want to go in, but um, the vast majority of the field is not being focused where these uncouplers are because it's rather open outward and it's quite aqueous filled, but about 10% of the field is being felt at that uncoupler site. We then use these simple ideas to make a simple mathematical um, differential equations model. And here's the idea. We're going to assume that the pink uncoupler right here is always bound in the transporter. And we're also going to assume something that we have not seen in the simulations to date. And that is that the uncoupler is going to induce some kind of a conformational change to open up some kind of a proton specific water wire or some kind of a small cavity from the inside, um, from the uncoupler site to the matrix. We don't know what this is yet. We have hints from, um, from a, a capacitive currents that there is a small conformational change that we have not seen in the simulations that is actually there in the protein once uncouplers bind. Then the, okay, so these uncouplers open this pathway. The rates, um, the rates of this simple model are informed either by obeying detailed balance or from the electrostatics calculations. And when we put all of this in and I solve for the steady state currents and sweep through a voltage, we get a prediction of rather small proton currents at minus 160, around 15 protons per second, uh, we believe could come in. Now, what are the assumptions? Well, this model on the top saying that a small number of protons could come in uh, is carried out at a pKa of 4.2. This is the pKa of DNP. And it also rationalizes our sulfonamide data. If the pKa goes more negative down to zero, like sulfonamide, it totally goes away because the residence time for protons on the uncoupler are too small. The last thing is we don't know anything about this matrix pathway opening up, but we do know in this simple model, if once the proton gets to the uncoupler, if it cannot quickly go through the matrix, you're done. It's not gonna produce any current unless this is around like a 10 nanosecond wait time. So we think that if the um, if this pathway does open up, it's got to be something like a water wire or an easily diffusible uh, place for protons to move through. Um, and so with that, we found that chemical uncouplers induce proton leak primarily through AAC, about 90% for the uncouplers that Amber's tested. These uncouplers and fatty acids bind along the translocation pathway, at least in our simulations. Um, and even small currents are likely to induce large leak because AC is the, it's one of the most highly dense um, proteins in the inner mitochondrial space. I think it's higher than even the FATP aces. Um, we need to validate these sites with directed mutagenesis. The problem is that I don't think there's been any study that's looked at mutagenesis on inner mitochondrial membrane proteins and then looked at their function. It's not amenable to that like many plasma membrane proteins. 
Um, and we're now in the process of attempting uh, to identify novel uncouplers that are not protonophoric and won't have this pH degrading activity all throughout the cell. And so with that, I will end by uh, just thanking again, Paula did the docking, Amber did all of the work on uh, the experiments, and Andrew did all the simulations um, in collaboration with Yuri. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Michael. Very nice talk. Um, I will start with some questions from uh, the audience. One second, there is a chat. It's so hard to see, sorry. So, Lucy says, very nice talk, interesting interplay between protein and the environment. And then uh, she asked, how specific is the proposed mechanism? Can it happen in other mem members of the family? Yeah, so Lucy, that's exactly, oh, is there? I can, is... the third, and, I mean, the third one, I can say it later. Okay. So I apologize that the sun is not behaving well. Um, we, so there's always some residual current that happens, unlike the uh, brown and beige fat where we know we're hitting UCP1 and the GDP just kills all the current. In skeletal muscle, there's always something left over. There's four AC1-like proteins, and there's, as I said, 50 other family members. I have a very sneaky suspicion that it's probably hitting others, um, and that's probably one reason why it's a little hard to, to get really solid knockouts of one protein that does the whole thing. Um, and so because all these, all these uncouplers, they're really chemically different looking, except they've got a greasy part and a delocalized proton accepting part, but they all seem to do it. And so that was a little bit surprising and I wouldn't be surprised if it's finding homologous proteins and, and doing the same thing. Okay, so uh, there was a last part of the question, which was if um, this mechanism was uh, could be related to sequence. Sequence of the protein? I guess so. Yeah, so I mean, I, I can't really, so unfortunately, I think we've only seen AAC1 structures. Um, you can make homology models probably of AAC2, 3, and 4, but we haven't done it. Um, you know, seeing a UCP1 structure would be amazing too. Um, I think lots of people are working on these things and it'll be interesting to see going forward. We haven't done any work to think about how it might be hitting these other homologs and sequence identity. Okay, so you have also a question from Vasco who says, thanks so much. How do you account for different isoform of AAC or... I or UCPs, by the way, because I think I saw that the knock, knockout does not totally abolish it. Yeah, so I think I just answered that question. We don't, we don't, and, and, I, and I think that, I think it's hitting homologs. Okay, so there are no more questions, so I will thank you again. Thanks. Michael, thank you for the talk. Thank you.